let's get going because we're, we're pretty much on the hour. I'm sure some more people will join us in a minute. Um, so welcome to today's SQL Office Hour session. Uh, it's great to be here. This is a chance for you to ask me your questions about Oracle Database. As usual, we have a focus for this particular session. Each session we cover one topic, but you're free to ask any other things we've got. Assuming we've got time at the end. And we're going to be looking at, as the question said, which indexes should I create? So first thing I'll do is I will jump straight over to a demo. So I've got a table here of orders. And there's there's quite a few rows in this table. There is one million rows, one million rows in this table. So it's fairly big. And I've got a few queries that I want to run out against it. So I'm running a query to look for all the orders for a particular customer, and we can see we get eight rows there. So not very many out of our one million. All the rows for a particular customer and date, and we get exactly one row for that query. Um, an order status is so slightly different now. Um, store, so where the goods were bought from, and the status cancelled. Again, we get exactly one row there. And then we're going to look for orders that are cancelled for our original customer. And again, we'll get just one row back there. So we've got a few different queries that we've run against our table. And if we just look um, and get the plan for these, so I'll go through, get the execution plan. Let's check that's all of them. And that will run through quickly, pick them all up. And we should see that as we scroll back up, we, so we've got full scan, of the orders table there, and we should find that all of these do in fact do a full table scan, which is, is not great. You know, we've got one million rows and most of these queries are only getting, you know, one row at most. You know, the ones get all the rows for a particular customer, um, found a few more, but yeah, we've got a whole bunch of full table scans. And if we scroll over, we see this does a lot of work in terms of buffers. That's a huge amount of work to just get like a handful of um, IO or the, you know, a handful of rows for these queries. So clearly, we want to create some indexes on these. So this is where things get a little bit interesting. Um, the question now is, well, which indexes should we create? So there's, there's lots of various options. So we just look at the queries again very quickly. I'll scroll back up. We've got looking for all the rows for just a customer, um, for a customer and date. Uh, we've got an order status and store, so location, and an order status and customer. So I will jump back to the slides at this point. So I've got a few possible indexes here, and I'm going to see if I can try a poll now. Um, so hopefully you should see a poll coming up of which of these indexes you think you should create. Now clearly, we probably want to create some of these, and we're full scanning this table with, um, and getting just a few rows back. So hopefully you can see, now select as many options as you want. We could just, you know, some of these are not mutually exclusive because we've got, you know, customer ID in this first one and then store ID and order status in the other. So there's quite a few different indexes we could create here um, to do this. So um, I see quite a few people coming in. I'll give you a few more seconds to think about that and choose the appropriate indexes there. Oh, quite a few more votes coming in. Um, so, do do do. And, okay, let me see. Please show the query again. Okay, I'll show the, I'll, I'll bring my screen up again. So, we've got several queries. We've got um, just on customer. So, customer alone. We've got customer and date. We've got order status and store ID and order status and customer ID. So four queries. Um, and so which of these, if we go back to our indexes over here, which of them should, would we like to create? We could create just customer. Um, we could create customer and order. Uh, we could create date, just status, store ID and status, or status and customer. Uh, maybe some other one that I haven't even suggested yet. Um, so a few more seconds to think about that. Um, so most people, a lot of us have, have voted now. So I'll give you another second or two. If you've got any other questions or comments in the chat, just you know, feel free to put them in. 
Okay, so I think uh, I'm not seeing any more choices come in. So I'll, I'll uh, oh, a few people think, thinking about it. <laughs> okay, that, let's close it down now. If you haven't had a chance to make your choice, that's fine. Just, you know, feel smug when I, we discuss it later. So hopefully, so we've ended that and we should see, hopefully now, can we see, can you see the poll results? So we can see what we've got here. Um, hopefully we'll see that so quite a few people went for just customer id um what went for customer and date and then we got um, a few takers for just date on its own a few takers for just status on its own quite a few for order store id and status and customer id and status and a few people picking something else but there's a good spread here you know um our most popular one only just over half of you have picked. So, you know, see, it's not clear exactly which ones we should choose. There's lots of choices we could go for um, about which we think is the best or the right indexes in these scenarios. So how do we, how do we decide? You know, quite often when um, we, you look, read about performance tuning and so on, it focuses on an, one individual query and says, how do we get the best performance out of this query? Which indexes should we create? But in a real application, you've got a whole stack of queries and you've got to weigh off the benefits of creating a great index for that query versus the other indexes and other queries that already exist in your database. So let's look at some of the things we need to consider. So before we get in that, the first thing we need to look at, want to look at is how the database searches indexes. Um, so the most common index we'll have in our Oracle database is a B tree. So if we look at the structure of that index to start with, so let's imagine we've got, um, got my, my bricks table that I love using. Um, so we've indexed the weight values. And so we've got our root block at the top and that splits it up into ranges. So from one to 100, 100 to 200 and so on. And then from there, it splits that up in further into further ranges. And then finally, we actually get to the actual row entries. So along the bottom here, we've got what the values in the table are and the row IDs, the pointer to those rows in the table. Um, so this is the basis of a B tree index. We store the um, range of values possible in the root and branch blocks so we get down to the individual values and the pointers. One other thing here is that on the bottom here, the leaves at the bottom, they all have um, pointers. So it's a doubly linked list. So if you're at this leftmost entry in the index, you've got pointed to the next one, and from there, you go back again. Um, so we can use this to search for values nice and effect effectively. So let's say we want to find all values between 90, all the weights between 90 and 110, or all the rows with that weight. So well, how do we do this? Well, we need to start with the root entry in our index and find the entry that has the value 90. Um, so that falls in the range 1 to 110. So that is our pointer to this block on the left over here. So we follow that down, find the entry within that, first entry greater than or equal to 90, until eventually we get down to the leaf. Once we're here, we can then just walk all along the leaf blocks to find the raw IDs, the pointers to those rows. So this is nice and efficient. Um, you know, we just go down the index once and then along the bottom for however many entries match that search. So this is if we've got one column, we're just searching on one particular column here. What if we've got a multi-column index? So that's this time I've indexed color and shape. Okay, so um, if we, we can see it first splits the rows up by color, so sorts them alphabetically, and then it sorts the rows alphabetically by shape as well within each color. So if we want to find all the rows for a particular color, say red, we find that entry in the root, travel down to the leaf, and then just walk along, essentially ignoring the values in the second column in the index. It's, it's irrelevant to our search here. So we can just search for those red entries. So that works quite well. Um, but what happens if we want to search on the shape? Uh, this is the second column in the index. So let's say we, we look for all the cubes. Now notice those cubes are spread throughout the entire index. Hmm. This makes, means that we're not able 
to search it very efficiently. Um, we have to visit every single block across the bottom here, and we can't um, easily limit down to just a few of these because we kind of got color in the way almost of the values that we're actually searching for. So um, the, in general, the database can't use the second column in the index. So if you've got a query that searches just for that column and it's second, third, fourth in an index, generally speaking, it won't use it. Um, now, there are some caveats to that. You know, some people are always quick to point out, well, you can do an index skip scan where it can bypass the first value and search for the second. Um, it's true the database can do that in some scenarios, but that, I think that's more of a happy coincidence rather than something you should design and plan for. Um, it's also possible we might just full scan the index because full scanning the index is probably quicker or cheaper than full scanning the table. So that's the first kind of principle we want to look at here. When searching um, and creating our indexes, make sure the, lead, the first columns in your index are in the where clause of at least one query, okay? Otherwise, they're gonna be less effective, and less useful. So that's the first point to be aware of. Questions, comments on that before we move on? No, okay. Um, you know, if, as I say, anytime, I'm keeping half an eye on the chat and QA, so if you've got any questions, just feel to type them in and I'll pick them up when I notice them and, and I'm able to answer. Oh, somebody's put their hand up. Who was putting their hand up? Who was that? Index skip scan. So, um, yeah, if, if we just go back quickly. So an index, so normally when you got an index, what we do is we start searching the columns left to right. So we do... If we had a query here, search for the red cubes, we'd go look for the entry that says red, then travel down to these ones and search for just the cubes within that. Um, within index skip scan, what the database can do and says, well, I know there's only a few different values here for color. So I can effectively jump past that um, and look straight for the cubes. Um, this will be less effective because of course, we've had to, you know, we're going and visiting every single block in this individual case. Um, but imagine we've got a, a much bigger index and only a small number of cubes. Let's say we've got all the different colors under the rainbow. Um, so we've got, look, well, actually it's probably not so good an example. We've only got a few different colors, um, but we've got lots of cubes and lots of cuboids, lots of stars, lots of different shapes. If we can go past the blue and look for the cubes within that, um, and let's say all, you know, we've got four entries here. The first ones are blue, and these are all cubes in this first one on the left. And then they're all cuboids, and then they're all stars, and then so on and so forth. We can go, okay, well, I'll skip past the blue color and just go straight to the cubes, and they all are all in one location. Um, so, you know, like I say, this is something that can happen in some scenarios, but it's generally best not to rely on it. So a question that come in, if you only have shape equals cube in our query, and if we try to add color equals color, will the index be used? So you mean the column equals itself? Um, not really, because it knows that the color, color equals color is true. You know, it doesn't do any filtering. If, on the other hand, if you're joining on that, so we're joining our bricks table to some other table, you know, um, colors table themselves, or we've got some other toys or shapes or whatever, then it can use that in the join criteria. So if you join on color and then filter on shape, then potentially it can use it. But if you're just saying, does the color from the bricks table, you could color for the bricks table, well, the optimizer knows that's an always true condition. So it, it doesn't help it in any meaningful way. So I hope that answers your question and not, and not anonymous. All right then. Okay, so first principle, make sure that the fir first columns in the index actually appear in the where clause of your queries. If it doesn't, the, uh, if it's not in the where clause of queries, probably not worth indexing or at least not putting as the first column. Okay, so let's look at the queries we had. So we had a Query on just on customer ID, in which case we probably want to create an index on customer. Well, we need to create an index on customer ID. That's our only option here. 
But if we look at the next one, well, we've got customer ID and order date time. Um, and we can create an index that exactly matches that, or we could stick with the index just on customer ID. We've kind of got a choice here. Both of these indexes could be used for both of these queries. You know, I've got customer ID as the first column here, so I can search that and ignore the date. Um, if we create the compound index, or if I've got customer ID and date, well, I can use just customer and do the filtering of the dates in the table um, and look at it that way. So at this point, there's kind of, you know, both of these are possible indexes. Let's look at our next query, order status um, and store ID. So these are both new columns. They haven't appeared in any of our other queries. So we will want to create an index on some combination of these. Which order we want to create them and um, so on, we'll, we'll discuss that in a second. But we want to index at least one of these, probably both of these columns. Now, there's where things get a bit more interesting. We've got order status and customer ID. Now, at this point, we could create a new index just on order status and customer ID, right? So we could create all four of the indexes that we've got here. But if we look at the ones we've already talked about, well, potentially, we've got one with one or two with customer ID as the leading column and one with order status as the leading column. So this third index, we probably don't need to create it or we need to think, do we really need to create it? Because if we do customer ID status, well, one of these first two indexes could have helped it. And if we did order status, store ID, maybe that index could have helped it. So there's lots of choices here about what we could have created. Um, so at this point, some people might kind of go, uh, well, why not just create them all? Why not just create all four of those indexes and stop worrying about it and just get on, get on with our lives um, and stop scratching our heads so much? Um, after all, you know, storage is really cheap these days. You know, it's, you know you've, we can measure storage. It's fairly cheap to get a terabyte of storage these days, relatively cheap. Um, the time I've spent talking to all of you about this is probably more than it costs us to buy that in the first place or something like that. Okay, so why not just create them all? And you could, but there are several reasons to do that, not to do that, to just try and create a few indexes. So first up, yes, storage is cheap, um, but there's a good chance you have got lots and lots of copies of your data. So we've got our production database. And if it's a critical database, you've probably got some kind of active stand, standby, maybe active data guard or something else pushing changes to a failover site. So you can swap backwards and forwards between these if there's some kind of problem here. And you might have some other kind of disaster recovery site, you know, a passive site, um, which is some other part of the world or really far away where, um, yeah, you're still shipping the changes to, but it's not as critical and kept up to date as your standby, but it's there in, in terms of extreme disaster. Um, and then you almost certainly have like your staging environment, pre-prod, QA, whatever you want, want to call it, which is usually a full copy of your production database. And then you'll have some number of test and dev databases, um, which again, there'll be some copy of the production database. Chances are few, if any of these are actually complete copies of production, but we could have quite a few of these. They may not all be separate databases. There might just be multiple schemas within one database and so on. But point here is, yes, we've got our production database. Um, you, for each bit of data in production, you could have five to 10 copies of that or five to 10, um, a multiple of five to 10 of that across your entire database state, estate by the time you've considered things like failover, QA, dev, test, and so on. So, you know, a thing, this may be cheap, but it isn't that cheap, right? When you multiply something up by a factor of 10, costs start to rise. But, you know, some of you may go, well, yeah, but storage is still really cheap, um, and we don't care about this. And it's true, some of you may be in that position where it's, it's just a non-issue for you. That said, as we increasingly move to cloud environments, um, people's perspectives on things change. So I've got a friend who's a development manager, and his philosophy in the past was that it's up to developers um, to create maintainable code. 
You know, it had to be perform well, had to perform um, fast enough so that customers went screaming about performance. But what was far more important was code maintainability so that people could change um, projects and so on and so forth. He's now starting to work in a more cloud environment and his perspective has started to shift a bit. You know, every month he's getting that bill of usage information about, you know, how much disk and CPU or compute power they're using on their cloud platforms. He's now starting to go, well, actually, I can see this bill here that I'm getting all the time. I'm going to start to tell my developers, well, I care more about reducing this cost, right? Some of these cloud bills can be, you know, thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions uh, in pounds, dollars, euros, whatever it is you work in. So these can add up really quickly. And if you can make small changes, you know, into the performance of your code or reduce your storage requirements, that can add up quite quickly. Um, and some people are starting to have that mindset shift of, well, we see this cost going in all the time, so let's let's try and keep it small. But okay, but the, if you've got a small database or cost isn't an issue for you, I'm not sure there's any companies where cost isn't an issue for them at all. But if you're in those environments, then um, you you might be like, the cost is cheap enough, we just don't really care. There's another consideration. So let's say we've got our production your production database. It's quite a big, meaty database. I don't know, ten terabytes in size, the data in it. It's very likely that the memory you have available for that database is measured in gigabytes, you know, an order of magnitude more or more less than you've got actual data stored in the database. Um, and you know, this is this is pretty common. Typically, you know, we the memory available to a database is some factor, quite often a large factor, less than total size of the database of, that's available. And this is a problem because you know there's been lots of improvements in disk and storage performance, you know SSDs and so on coming online, but still, relatively speaking, relative to memory access, it is still slow. You know, orders of magnitude slower. So you want the data that you're reading to be in memory or in the Oracle database in the buffer cache. And you know, so if our database is some multiple size of the memory you've got available, and you're like, well, how does that work then, right? How does the data stay cached if um, the database is some significantly significantly larger than the memory we've got available? Well, let's look at a table. Let's imagine this is our transactions table. Um, so a lot of your customer data, so transactions, orders, invoices, deliveries, payments, that kind of thing, um, they tend to, you tend to add more information. Uh, and this tends to go at the end of the table. And most of your queries against that data will be something like this. Look at the active orders or the unpaid invoices or the deliveries due in the next week. You tend to only look at recent information, generally speaking. And you know, typically, this will go towards the end of the table in the database. So as you insert more and more data, you go in a small fraction of a table could be huge, 10, 100 gigabytes in size. But the data we're interested in, that like customers query regularly, tends to be a small fraction of that, you know, maybe five or 10 percent of the total size of the table tops, possibly even less than that. So if we've got our 100 gig table, might be five, 10 gigs that we're actually query regularly and genuinely interested in regularly from table data. So that's fine, that then fits nicely in the memory we've got available. But we've got our indexes here on customer and then some other column. So we've got our indexes, we sort the values or the rows by um, customer ID first. So any customer comes along, they could be accessing any part of the index. So unlike the table where hopefully some small subsection of it is the data that actually we want in memory or is going to be accessible to memory, when it um, comes to the index, we probably need to keep the whole thing cached the entire time to be sure that it you know stays nice and performant. Um, so yeah, the more of these we've got, then the less memory we've got for other things, or we shrink the space available for table data. So you know, we also want to try and keep reduce how many we've got here. 
But again, some of you might be like, we don't care. You know, we're rich enough that we can buy nice beefy servers that um, with gobs of memory in them, or our data just isn't that big. You know, there's lots of critical databases which are pretty small. You know, it might only be 10, 20 gigs in size. It's still a critical core database that you need, but you can easily fit the whole thing in memory and you know index the the heck out of it and still have RAM to spare. So you don't worry about it in that scenario. Well, there's still some consequences to this. Um, so let's say we've got our query like this. We've got a query just on customer ID, and we've created indexes on these two indexes, customer ID and date, customer ID and status. The optimizer's now got a bit of a challenge. It's like, well, which of these indexes should I create, or which index should I use? Which is the best, which is the most effective for this query? Hmm. And um, it becomes a bit harder to tell. Now, in this example, it probably doesn't matter too much. You know, the difference between one or the other, one will be more effective than the other, but chances are the difference is marginal. Um, it's unlikely that the optimizer is going to make a truly bad decision choosing between these. Um, but the thing is, the difference between them is more subtle than full table scan versus index. You know, we could discount, okay, we don't want full table scan, but the choice between these is much finer. Things get a bit more interesting if we've got a more complicated query with a whole bunch of things in join or um, filter criteria and a whole stack of indexes available. Suddenly, not quite so clear about which is the right, which is the best index to use. And um, the performance difference between the fastest of these and the slowest of these could just start to get quite a bit larger. You know, if our table stats are slightly out of date or the optimizer thinks one's slightly more attractive than the other, then yeah, it's more likely it's going to end up making an incorrect choice here. So the more more options you give it, the harder its decision process becomes. And it's just the more work it does. You got one index, it's pretty easy. I use the index or I go for a full table scan, right? Um, and But if you've got five indexes, well, we haven't got just five times the number of options. We could use each of those indexes in individually. Um, the optimizer can do things like use two or three indexes and join the indexes themselves rather than actually uh, before accessing the table. You might do a full index scan rather than a range scan and so on. So we're not just giving it four more options by adding four more indexes. We're probably giving it like 10, maybe 20 more options of different execution plans we could come up with by creating all these different indexes. So try and create few indexes. Um, reduces you know, your storage costs, um, makes it easier the optimizer to see what's going on um, and makes it more likely that you can fit all the working data in RAM. So I see there's a few other index, uh, questions that have come in. So let me just address those before we move on. So, uh, so I mean, is the rule change when you have partitions? Um, I'm, I'm not sure which rule you're referring to exactly there, if you could clarify, but broadly speaking, um, you still need, uh, I guess maybe you're asking when we're talking about leading columns there, you still need the leading column or you still want the leading columns of the index to be in your where clause. Um, so yes, basically, I mean, partition elimination and things can help. Um, partitioning is a big topic. Um, maybe we've got some time at the end, we could go in a bit more detail, but it's, you know, it's a whole session in its own right partitioning, so we can get into the details of that in another time. So from Pedro, does index affect performance since index has to be updated for each DML operation? So that's another another good point, actually, Pedro, something I didn't mention. Every time you insert, update, or delete a row, the database has to maintain the indexes on those. So you've got no indexes whatsoever, then it just sticks the row in, in the table. If you've got one index, well, it has to do that, got two, and so on. So yes, it will increase the work. Um, how much work? It obviously depends. You know, if you've got an update and it changes one column, there's no indexes on that column, then there's no, you know, no impact there. If there's five indexes on that column, uh, you know, it varies. But yes, um, as we add 
more indexes, you're going to have more impact to your DML statements um, and you know all your writes that you make to your database. Okay, so question, other questions, uh, comments before we move on. So Azim, would it be better to do a full table scan in this case? Um, not sure which case you're referring to there, Azim. So if you could uh, explain there what you're what you're referring to, um, we can come back to that in a minute. Alrighty then. Um, Okay, so I don't think we've got any other questions at the moment. I think I've covered all those stuff. So we want to create create few indexes. We want the columns in your where clause to be the first columns in the index, and we want to try and create as few of them as possible. So let's take take things back a little bit. So let's say we've just got one query on customer ID and status. Just got one query, that's it. We only need to worry about this one. Um, the question here is, well, uh, which order do we want to create the indexes on? So do we want to create customer ID and then status, or status and then customer ID? Hmm. An interesting question, right? Um, so assuming, you know, if we had a query just on customer ID, we'd want to prefer that. Or if we had a query just on status, again, we might prefer that. But assuming no other queries, it's, oh, well, what do we do? Um, and generally speaking, in terms of finding the rows, it doesn't really matter. You know, both will find the same rows, they'll both locate to the same section of the index. So what you want to look at is how compressible the values are, okay? Um, and what we need to look at there is which have the values which are most compressible. We want to put the most compressibles first, ideally. Okay, so if we did an index on status and then customer ID, so you can see basically in the index, you've got cancel, 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 so on, um, and then your order, your customer IDs, and complete, then your customer IDs, and open, and so on. So we are duplicating those status values many, many times in the index. Um, and as, you know, Good developers and so on. We you know whenever you're duplicating or doing something lots of times, you're kind of like mm, maybe there's a better way of doing this or reducing the information. Um, so what we can do is compress the index. So if we compress the first column of that index, essentially what the database is does something a little bit like this. Instead of actually storing the status values, it can create a prefix for this and say, okay, well instead of storing cancelled, I'll just map zero to the value cancelled. So then I can just store zero in the index. So we're significantly reducing the size of the index, the size of the values that were actually there. And you can see just kind of looking at it visually on left and right, we've got a lot less stuff on, on the right here than we do on the left. So by compressing these values, um, we, get, we can get better performance. We can pack more index entries into smaller, um, space into less space into fewer blocks which means it's more efficient to search them a little bit of cpu overhead to decompress them as we actually read the values but generally speaking that's fairly low um, so we want to look at this and kind of uh, if we've compressed this first value here status we've we've done pretty well what if we've reversed the values what if we flip them the other way around and store it customer id and then status well, our compression hasn't done quite so well here, has it? We're compressing that first value, but actually we're just mapping one to zero, two to one, and so on. Hasn't saved us very much. Now, obviously in the real world, you've probably got a lot more than three customers in your real database, so you, you will get better savings than it looks like here, but it's clear that they're not as big as they are for the status value. Um, so a couple of reasons for that. First up, there are just, fewer values for status um you know typical things for order status like cancelled complete paid delivered or shipping so on maybe five or ten different values um in a typical customer facing business you probably have hundreds thousands maybe even millions of different customer ids um customers the different customer ids so it seems like uh, customer id status is the one that we should put first in the index because we a lot more repeated entries, a lot more 
entries have the same value, so we get more um, deduplication there, and the values themselves are just longer as well. So it looks like a slam dunk going for status in this scenario. And there's a lot of advice around this saying you should, in order to get the best compression, you should put the columns um, with the fewest distinct values, that is, ones that are going to have the most duplicates in first in the index. I want to change that or adjust that slightly. So, so, so far, we've been looking at using basically like sequences to assign our customer IDs. Um, now, I wonder, if, is there anyone here who used GUIDs to generate their primary key values? Oh, interesting. Um, let's see what happened when we use a GUID instead. Wow, we've got this big, long, you know, 16-byte raw or 32-character varchar, how have you stored it? This is a much bigger value now for customer ID. Um, and yes, there's a lot more different values for customer ID, but you see, removing status, um, we've shrunk that down. But we can get much, much bigger savings by compressing the customer ID values as well. So we flip that around. Um, so we remove this big, long um, GUID that we have. So, you know, it's, it's one of those classical um, arguments in database design. Do you use sequences or do you use GUID to generate your primary key values? Um, ultimately, it comes down to your trade-offs and which you think, which you prefer to live with. But this is something more that you want to think about if you're using GUIDs. So those fire and key columns are going to be big, long GUIDs, um, use more space. That means indexing them. They, you know, you're going to need more storage space for those index indexes. So you want to put the compressible values first. So you want to put the most compressible values as the first index or the first columns in your index. Now, note this is like the last mile of uh, tuning, um, which you know, making sure the columns are actually used in your query in your where calls is more important than this. But once you've assessed that. Can then start looking at um, compression for the index to help decide the audio there. So I see there's a whole bunch of questions come come in while I've been chatting away. So let's just whiz back through a few of these. All right then. So uh, Hachemi, select count style from T where sys state between D1 and D2. Um, okay, you'll need to put a bit more context on that one. What your what your question is? It's, what you're trying to say there? Okay, from Anonymous, are indexes recommended for in-memory tables with the read-only use cases and insert update insert use cases? Um, so, well, let's, let's forget the read-only and update, uh, uh, read-only versus insert update for the moment. Um, so, if you're talking about the database in-memory option, so the co columnar store for Oracle Database, then um, the idea is this helps with analytic queries. So the kind of thing you're doing, um, show me the total number of um, orders we placed this past week. Um, show me all the, get me all the customers um, with unpaid orders this year or who are late with payments this year, that kind of thing. This is where you're typically reading a large set of data and grouping it down to relatively few rows. So you're processing, processing lots and lots of um, data. So the in -mem database in memory, the in-memory column store is um, great for those type of queries. The kind of queries we've been looking at so far are generally ones where we expect to get relatively few rows back. Um, now some businesses, you might have just a handful of customers, each of which place lots and lots of orders. But if we talk about your typical consumer retail type of business, you'll have lots and lots of customers, which each which of which place few orders. So if you're creating um, identify queries, get few rows, and you know get few rows, process few rows from the table, then you still want to stick with the regular um, B tree indexes we've been talking about so far. You've got those more um, aggregate analytic style queries which process huge volumes of data, database in memory can help with those and potentially be a way to replace those indexes. But it's something you need to assess and analyze um, and look at your workload and see what's going on there. So Jimmy, select counts are from T where says, should I use an index ask or desk? Um, so the index ascending or descending 
controls how which order the entries go in the index. Um, so does it sort them ascending or does it sort them descending? And if you just got a one column index, it kind of doesn't really matter. Um, just stick with the default of um, ascending. Where it can really help is if you've got an order by with three or four columns in it, and you've got column one, order by column one descending, order by column two ascending, order by column three descending, so on and so forth. Some kind of mixing and matching between ascending and descending in your order by. If you've got your index and you know identified your columns in your where clause and then include the order by columns at the end of it, matching the ascending descending, the database can avoid a sort. So it can read the entries, the index, um, in exactly the same way order that your query will return the rows. So it avoids a sorting operation. Um, so the query you've shown, doesn't matter. Um, just select date between two values, just create the index. If you've got an order by, then look at an order by with many columns particularly, and you can look at order by descending, ascending, and see if that um, helps out. So that helps Jimmy. It's anonymous, this compressing of index values, is this done by index compression, i.e. is this a feature you have to turn on? Yes. So it's a good question, anonymous. Um, so there are there's two types of um, this compression. There's just the basic compression where you, you know, if I go back up a little bit, when you create or rebuild an index, you can specify compress n, and that's how many columns of the index that you can compress. Um, and that's something you have to do yourself, have to do manually. Um, that's available in all editions of Oracle Database. There is also the um, advanced compression option, which has more abilities there. So you can say compress for query high and low and things. And the database can detect that for you, okay? Um, so you, you just specify compress for query high, low, and so on, and the database will figure out the best compression methods. Um, and you don't need to kind of worry about this. Big drawback of that is, as I said, it's part of the advanced compression op option, so you do need to be licensed for that. Um, so be aware of that. Um, but for this kind of basic compression, everyone can do it, but you need to think about which columns you can compress a bit more. So hope that helps anonymous. You did, this index is not unique, so you can compress two. Yeah, well, that's a good, great point. Well, if we look at the values here, they are unique, you know, so. Um, Yes, it's a great point, Eudis. Um, the You can compress all the values in an index. Um, and provided that there are some repeated values, compression can help. Thing, one of the reasons compression isn't on by default always is if that you are compressing unique values, it will actually make the index bigger. So if you try and compress the unique index, a one column unique index, it will get bigger. Um, so this only helps when there are duplicate values to actually remove. Um, in this scenario, it kind of doesn't matter or it shouldn't matter, it might do. Um, depends on how many different customers you get. If you get a lot of customers, you place one, maybe two orders, then it, it might still matter. To do, do anonymous, how do you avoid full table scans when column data is null? Um, so a couple of things. To think about there. First up, is, you know, if if you're searching for columns that ex of a particular value, then you're gonna, you, you know, we can use the index to search that. Um, second, try and avoid having null in your table. You know, um, maybe provide suitable defaults instead of null. You've got to think about that. Be careful. You know, try and avoid magic values to mean null, which aren't really null, and that can cause you more problems. Um, and then as long as there's at least one non-null entry in your index, the database can still use it. So if you've got a nullable column um, and you create an index with the value uh, with the value one on the end, then that every index every entry in the every row in the table will have an entry in the index. So you can create a mandatory column in the index. So as long as at least one expression in the index is always uh, has a non-null value, every row will be there and the database can use it to do things like process count styles and so on. Um, if you're trying to find rows where values are null, things get a bit more tricky, 
might want to look at function-based indexes and so on. So I mean, does compression only affect the first column of the index? Uh, no, as we were just discussing, you can compress the whole index. Um, the closer the values are to unique, the less value you will get out of it. Um, and they'll say, if the whole column, if it is a unique index, compressing the whole thing will actually make it bigger because <laughs> you kind of get this prefix on the value itself. But um, so the uh, um, hope what we discussed earlier answered it. Uh, Gino, prefix compression is only available on Enterprise Edition and higher. Thank you, Gino. Thanks for clarifying that. Um, EJ, when should a bitmap index be used over a B tree index? Okay. Um, so, first thing to be aware of for a bitmap index is it uh, brings about a problem which almost never exists in Oracle Database, and that's inserting, updating, deleting rows in one session can block insert updates or deletes of other rows in another session of completely separate rows, you know, different where clauses, no clashes on primary unique keys values. Um, exact whys and wherefores of that, uh, probably a bit more to go to, into in that in this session. So be very careful about using them in, um, you know, customer transactional applications where you're doing lots of, you've got an application at, inserting, updating, deleting lots of rows at the time. What they are very useful for is data warehouses. We've got one session which loads your data, and then you've got a lot of ad hoc queries. The big advantage of bitmaps is you can have single column indexes, and the database can really efficiently use bitmap operations, bitmap and bitmap or, and things like that, to combine them, figure out which rows they can actually use. So generally, you want to use it for um, data warehouses or re reporting tables um, where you only have one session at a time writing to them. Um, other things to be aware of is bitmap indexes are also an enterprise edition only uh, or better feature as well. So um, I hope so. That's uh, hope that answers that for you. Okay. Uh, so there's oh, one more I missed. So. When we use a direct loading method, will the compress benefit in terms of performance? Um, I, so I'm not sure exactly what you're asking there. Um, when you do compress the index, the, there will be a slight hit to putting the values in and getting them out because the database has to do the work there. Really, the best thing there is to measure it, test check what happens um, you know for all of these things it's always worth doing your own test and checking and see what actually happens on your database because um, there's always subtle differences which can lead to different things happening so check and test what happens on yours alrighty then oh we we got lots of questions today inquisitive audience today okay so do 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 um, dum 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 so we had two indexes, one C2, two C1, C2, and we query C1 equals one and C2 equals two. Could we drop index one? Yes, you can drop index one. And so if you've got index on column one and index on column one and column two, then um, really you probably don't need the index on just on column one, or you don't need, you don't really need both of those index, or it's rare that you need both of those indexes. Um, what if we had query with C1 equals one? Is it more expensive to use instead of using the already dropped index? So this is the thing you've got to trade off, you've got to decide. Having the index on just one column, um, then you're not able to filter the query on the two columns quite as effectively, right? Whereas if you create the index on both columns and you query just one of those, just the first column, well then the index is going to be bigger. It's got more data to include in it. So it's going to be slightly less efficient for the for that um, index. So it, it, it's that trade-off. Which query is more important to you? Which one do you want to be faster? Which one does it matter that is it's quicker? Um, so you know you need to assess and see what's going on. Okay. Uh, Anything else people want to say, suggest, um, discuss before we before we move on and um, wrap up, or uh, before we move on? 
Lots of, lots of good questions today. Um, Azim, okay, so you, so you come back, Azim. The last example you talked about where customer ID, order status, date, etc. Uh, yeah, you'll have to be a bit more <laughs> explicit about what you're looking for, Azim. I'm uh, lost track of what I was discussing earlier. <laughs> Okay, so you do compressible columns first or columns that m most appear in where clauses first. So look at your where clauses first. That is the most important thing because um, we, you can get yourself in knots with all this compression stuff and find out the database isn't even going to bother to use the index because it, the columns you put first are not in the where clause of enough queries or critical enough queries. So compression is like a secondary consideration. Okay, um, the most important thing is which columns are in your where clauses. Consider that first. Okay, I think I've covered most of the stuff we've talked about so far. So let's just, uh, let's go on. So let's let's go back uh, to my, let's go back to my screen here and hopefully. So we, we looked at various options here and we've seen, so let's just scroll down go back and if we look and see what indexes we've got here think you think oh that's interesting um, while we've been discussing the database has gone and created a whole bunch of indexes for us um, so I don't know if any of you have been eagle-eyed and noticed my database name ATP autonomous transaction processing um, I've been using the new our autonomous database and automatic indexing will do a lot of this stuff in the background for us it will analyze the workload and say well what queries have you run and what is what do i think is the best or the fewest indexes that we should create to support those and it's come up with this little set here so notice it hasn't created the index just on customer id alone so if we run my queries again so let's just spin them through, all through, hopefully, we should now see that they all do, in fact, use an index. So the thing, thing is, you know, we talked a lot there. This decision about which indexes to create for an entire workload is tricky, right? There's lots of trade-offs. There's lots of, uh, is this the right index? What index should I create at a particular time? Uh, it's not obvious. So by analyzing the actual queries that run against your database and putting that through the workload, automatic indexing kind of does all this for us. So we can see it's chosen that index just on customer ID. Um, unfortunately, they've got lovely little names like this. Makes It's not immediately obvious which um, what, which are the ones it's used. But we can now see, again, yep, so this one on orders, that's fetched, that found that index. And we got our order status and store ID, it's created that index. We created one on orders as well. And finally, hopefully, this index has created one as well. So in terms of kind of trying to create a small set of indexes for you, autom autonomous or automatic indexing will help do this. Um, and, you know, this is good because it's really easy to get this wrong. You know, I've, I've seen tables and if you've worked on databases which are more than you know, 10 years old, you've probably seen too, the table with more indexes on it than there are columns in the table, right? Um, people kind of get a bit carried away. They don't pay attention to what indexes are already there. By using this, database is able to consolidate these down into as few as possible. Now, appreciate it's going to be a while before a lot of you are on autonomous. So you need to think about which order you want those indexes to be created. Um, and if we just come back over here, we can see, so try and keep the number of indexes that we create small. Um, that, you know, reduces your storage requirements, makes more efficient use of your memory, um, reduces the overheads on your inserts, updates, deletes, and just makes the optimizer's decision choices a lot easier, you know, rather than having to choose between 10 things, it's only got to choose between two or three things. Try and keep them small. Um, it's also important when it comes to figuring out, do I want to drop indexes, right? Very tricky decision. Index doesn't look like it's used, 
but oh, is it really? Is it really not used? Mm, I'm not sure. Um, so if you you know try and keep the number of indexes you create small. When sorting them, put the columns that appear in your where clause with the quality conditions first. Then columns with range conditions, um, greater than, less than, and then um, any other order by select columns. So you can do things like create an in covering index. We've selected um, all the orders for today. So insert date greater than a day and the customer ID. We create order date and customer ID and the database can just read the index rather than reading the table as well. Um, so generally, you just want to stick to ones in the uh, conditions in your where clause as a priority though. And when it comes to compression, you want the compressible columns first. If you are using advanced compression, if you've got advanced compression, um, then the database can figure out, do some magic, figure out how to compress it for you. If you're not and you've got enterprise edition, then you can specify which columns or how many columns to compress. Um, bit of work there, but consider this after you've considered these first two things, okay? Um, and finally, Automatic indexing can help you with those first two problems. Which are the smallest set of indexes that I should create, right? Um, at the moment, it's, you know, if you're licensed for it, it can use advanced compression, but it doesn't take that into account when deciding index column order. Maybe that will come at some point in the future, but right now it just um, looks at what columns are used in your where clause and so on. If you want to know more about this, um, I really recommend Richard Foote's blog. He talks about all of the things I've been talking about, you know, index compression, which order to put them, how autonomous and automatic indexing decides which indexes, which columns to use, and so on and so forth. So we've got a few minutes left in the session. So uh, let me just see where, where, let's see if there's any f final questions or comments before we wrap up. Let me go bring the QA back up. I've lost it now. All right. Okay, so from Anonymous, is it mandatory to have an index on a foreign key? Um, it's not mandatory. You don't have to have an index on a foreign key. Um, so a few things to be aware of, though. If you delete or update, delete rows from the parent or update the primary key column in the parent table, then you will want an index on the foreign key column. This prevents um, some locking issues. So if you update or delete from the parent, then yes, you want it. Otherwise, just standard, you know, is it used in join or where clauses, rules apply. You know, if, if you never join on that column for some reason, um, then you probably don't need an index on it. And, you know, equally if you've got no where clauses that use it, so you don't have to. It's generally a good idea. Um, you know, it's uh, so it, it's kind of up to you. You know, it's safer to just create them. Then you know, if anyone does run a big delete on the parent for some reason or another, you're not going to run into any strange locking issues or other performance issues. But um, you don't have to do it. Can you please explanation for bullet two in the summary, please? This, okay, Amy, so, okay, so we talked about how you want the columns in, um, put the columns in your where clause first uh, in your index. So if columns are not in your where clause, they wanna be towards the end of the list. But then there's still a bit of a choice that you can have here. I, I didn't actually talk about it in too much detail in this session, but, um, if you've got columns where you've got column equals this, so customer ID equals this, and order date is greater than sys date minus seven, you know, the past week, for example. Um, pretty common, find my recent transactions query. So you want the column that has the equals in it first in the index, because it goes and finds those index entries where the customer equals that value, and then travel along all the um, dates that are greater than that that entry. So you want the columns with equality equals conditions first, and then any that have greater than, less than, between, that kind of thing to be second, third, fourth in the index. Then finally, 
any columns which are just in the select or just in the order by. So hopefully that helps explain that, Amy. Uh, okay, I'm not seeing, so the strange thing about this QA window, things keep appearing um, out of sequence for some reason. So hopefully I've addressed everything that you've got. I see a question, comment from Barry in the chat. Um, we'll cover that and I think we'll wrap up because we're pretty much on the hour. Okay. Uh, Barry, foreign key columns are generally supposed to be indexed. If the F key, F key column is multi-column, does the F key index necessarily need to exactly match in terms of columns and column order? I.e. the column F key index, F key has three columns, can the index be missing the third column or can the index have the four, an extra fourth column? Um, so let's, let's, let's keep it simple. So let's say, um, you've got a one column foreign key. Um, you can add extra columns on the end of that and it still solves like the foreign key parent update problem that we were talking about earlier. So you can add extra columns at the end of it. Now, let's say, let's knock it up. You've got a two column foreign key, which points to a two column primary key. Um, then yes, you need to include all, both of those columns in the foreign key, in the index for that foreign key. Um, does it need to match in, exactly in terms of column order? No, I'm not sure at the moment. I'd have to double check that and test that, Barry. Um, but you can have more columns than the foreign key has in the index, but you don't want less. Okay, so hopefully that answers um, at least part of your question there. Actually, there was one other question that I did note, uh, doo -doo -doo -doo, and that was about indexes for primary. Did I answer that about index for primary key? I oh, know it's index of foreign key. Alrighty then, we are kind of on the hour now, so uh, let's. I'll leave that up for you to take a look, take your screenshots off. Um, the recording will of this will be available sometime soon. You know, stay tuned later this week. Um, if you've subscribed to the session, you should get the email from it. So um, all that's left to say is, uh, really hope you enjoyed this. More importantly, I hope you learned something and stay tuned. See you next time. Thank you. Goodbye.